Okay, hey everyone. This is Zach with Interviews Etc. I'm here with Oren Luck. Is that how you pronounce? That is yeah. how I how you pronounce my name. So. Okay, good. Uh, he is a uh, video maker, obviously here on YouTube with his, uh, I guess, series. It's not just a video game. I think you could probably call it that. Sort of. That's the big theme of your videos. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a good place to start off. Um, what do you mean by they're like the subject of your video is not just a video game. What does that exactly mean? Well, it's it's kind of a reverse of when kind of I don't know when my parents would tell me it's just a stupid video game. It's kind of me saying it's not just a video game. It's it's actually something more. And even though that there are a lot of video games that fit the it's just a stupid video game uh, tagline, um, I would say that uh, there are some games that transcend uh, what we think of as video games. And it's time to look at them as more than just a pastime and that there are some video games that um, really have some cinematic uh, poetry going on. So mm -hmm. I, the main reason why I started this channel was that one time I was reading an interview with Guillermo del Toro, the yeah. director of Pan's Labyrinth and The Devil's Backbone. And he said that in some ways, video games are becoming more cinematic than movies. So I wanted to explore that, um, mainly just kind of taking these video games and seeing where these video games could p potentially be getting their inspiration from, even if they're not directly getting their inspiration from certain types of cinema, my job was to sort of uh, make those links to say, okay, take a look at Team Eco, T take a look at what they're doing. They're, what they're doing is kind of similar to what silent era film went and filmmakers were doing. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what I was looking at. Um, I really wanted to explore what Del Toro said um, of course, I'm biased because he's one of my favorite directors, but um, I really wanted just to explore that idea that, huh, should, should we be taking video games more seriously than we are and really yeah. kind of address them as some sort of cinematic art form, um, which is also kind of a similar. There's a similar thing going on with television right now, too, where people used to see television as like a more inferior version of cinema. But now with TV shows like. Breaking Bad, The Sopranos, The Wire, um, The Americans, all this great stuff. It's making us think, oh my gosh, is television becoming more cinematic than movies? So it's kind of interesting mm -hmm. seeing how this one art form is kind of, um, well, these two art forms are kind of transcending what we initially thought they were. Right. It's, I kind of maybe not have a problem with how you frame games as being cinematic but on the one hand it's like yes games are like a visual medium so inherently you can do things with the camera that cinema also does and it's like okay we can give information and narrative via visuals right but like i don't know i guess people generally have a problem with games trying to be movies you know that's always been a big controversy and you know the controversy with cutscenes is that games aren't movies you know they should you know, divorce themselves from the, you know, classic cinema storytelling and just sort of do things through gameplay and stuff. Um, but I guess your videos also shine a light on how, you know, uh, like, so you talk about Shadow of the Colossus and uh, Last Guardian, how they kind of uh, stay away from cutscenes and are able to do narrative still via, you know, camera work and animation and stuff like that to tell some of the story um and they don't devolve into the you know the root cutscene stuff right. um where was i going with that uh sorry um no it's all good i i actually kind of feel like i know where you're going with this because um but but yeah i'll let you finish your thought <laughs> it's just it's just um i guess it's kind of weird to call video games cinematic when it feels like they're kind of above it but i also obviously agree that the visuals are important as well because that's one of the senses that the games tap into you know like every part of the piece every part of the text is 
you know, there's audio, there's visuals, there's gameplay. All of that has some meaning behind it. And like, I think it's important to talk about the cinematic elements, but it kind of, I guess you put it at the forefront where some people might not be as comfortable with it. Yeah, it's it's really just um, it's it's more of an exploration, and there and I feel like my argument, well, not really my argument, my exploration, sort of what I'm getting into, does not apply to every video game. And I think mm-hmm. a good example, a great example, would be like the Dark Souls games or Bloodborne, <laughs> which are fir- first and foremost games. Um, yeah, how those games tell their stories through through um, the environment, through item descriptions, um, through things that you really have to closely observe, through enemy placement. Those yeah. games are first and foremost games. You can't really take those games and put them into the cinema argument or discourse. And that's also true with, I'd say, even Legend of Zelda. I mean, what makes games like Breath of the Wild so critically acclaimed isn't because they're like movies, it's because it's the way it the way it takes the open world formula and really kind of makes it a, its own and kind of change that Ubisoft f- formula to make it a little less restrictive has made it the game it is. It isn't because it's cinematic. But right. when you look at games like Shadow of the Colossus or The Last Guardian, I feel like those two games in particular are just essential examples of of how it's you could take this visual storytelling that's very characteristic of silent era cinema or art house cinema and and really kind of make an extraordinary game. So it doesn't really apply to every game, and in some t- sometimes you are right. Um, sometimes it, the cinematic aspects of a game is actually a detriment. Um, that's actually one of my biggest criticisms of Metal Gear Solid games, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which is, you know, not really controversial at all. Like, like Metal Gear Solid Four was, uh, I was just flabbergasted <laughs> by the time I finished that game. I was just, I, right. it was just uh, too much. It was just too much. And I mean, that anyway. game didn't even have the sorry. The game didn't even have the decency to like animate everything, like you say in your video. <laughs> yeah. It just has powerpoints. Like it just <laughs> it has just has powerpoints, yes. <laughs> which is pretty <laughs> egregious, you know. Oh god, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I think my favorite Metal Gear Solid game is Five, and that's because it's the one that has the least <laughs> amount of story. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like for it's a game, you know. It's fun, right? And oh, it's definitely the best game. Like, it, I mean, people could probably argue three, but yeah, like to play five feels amazing. Oh, oh. I know. <laughs> just running around, just walking around is like holy shit. This is <laughs> this isn't some clunky PS2 game. This is amazing. It's um, it's so it it feels so great to play, and it's just so funny because. When you, whenever I get to the cutscenes, I'm like, oh my gosh, get on with it already. <laughs> I can't, like, that one scene, spoilers for people who haven't played MGS5, but it's not really spoilers, but that scene when you're in the Jeep with uh, the villain and you're just sitting there and you're talking for like 15 minutes about mm-hmm. stuff that I don't even remember because it was so unremarkable. <laughs> Uh, it's just like it's just like oh gosh can we uh kojima can you just not can you not do this right now i don't need right. this i want to just i just want to raid bases in a, in a helicopter with final countdown playing on and just uh <laughs> having fun i don't need this story what is this <laughs> yeah so yeah like it's it's interesting again you can't really make a video like the kinds the kind of videos i make with a game like MGS Five, it just doesn't work. It just it just right. doesn't work. <laughs> so yeah, I think I mean I guess you could probably look at the minutia, like different not minutia, the smaller moments. Like obviously there are cutscenes, and maybe you want to look at those. Or say like Ocarina of Time has like the letterboxing effect when right. you lock on. Like you know, there's obviously that probably wouldn't make a great long video. <laughs> yeah, but um. I mean, maybe you could look at trends and stuff like that, maybe in Legend of Zelda. Um, But there's definitely, you know, what what people do with the camera, I guess, is kind of inherently cinematic. Obviously, it might not be calling from, like, 
yeah, like um, like a great director like Del Toro or whatever. But um, like for example, your PT video, it it's not really about like the camera necessarily. Like right. obviously, it's the first. You know, uh, Del Toro. I don't think he's ever made a first person movie. There's not many of those. Hardcore Henry. That's probably about <laughs> it. But, um, oh, and some, man. and I guess like handheld movies. But uh, like that was more about the imagery and like sort of his themes rather than the camera stuff. So yeah, definitely. I guess you can still like tie in, you know, the inspirations of film to games without talking about the language of film, which you do. Uh, well, well, there's a, a lot of aspects to cinema. Um, I mean, David Lynch, for example, he's not really known for his framing as much for how he uses sound and how he uses atmosphere, which is something you can totally see in PT. Um, so, so there are elements that it, it's not necessarily all about the frame. It, there are other aspects of cinema that do apply to video games like i'm sure you can make a video about silent hill 2 and how that game uses atmosphere and fog and sound to to create um the psychological horror that it creates so um Mm -hmm. so yeah i i mean there's not just one aspect of cinema so right yeah it's true cinema has a pretty unique way of yeah creating tone creating atmosphere right it's something like the written word doesn't necessarily i mean you know it attempts but like it's easier to be inspired by a movie with a game because they're both visual in some way right than like a game and a book i mean i guess bloodborne kind of did that with the lovecraft stuff but um that's kind of going into very <sighs> like they had to create they had to sorry they had to um take the creativity in their own hands. I mean, the descriptions that HP Lovecraft uses are pretty like strange and probably not easy to visualize, you know? So you had to kind of go out on your own or take what like some filmmakers probably uh, did with it. I couldn't think of any, I mean, I guess probably Del Toro has some HP Lovecraft in, I don't know. I've only seen Pan's Labyrinth. So, (laughs) uh, (laughs) Well, you know, get, kind of going off that point, uh, part of the reason why I love Bloodborne so much, Bloodborne is honestly probably my favorite video game. I love that game so nice. much. It's so good. I will not argue against that. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good game. Um, it, it, I think you're exactly right. Um, what, what Bloodborne did so effectively was um, use item descriptions to create a sense of fridge horror. Um, it was, and that's something that Lovecraft would do is that they would, he wouldn't use item descriptions, of course, but he, (laughs) in his, in his writing, he would, uh, he wouldn't explicitly state the horror. He would just make you imagine it. And that's what I love about Bloodborne is that some of the theories that some of the item descriptions allude to are, are so horrifying. And that's what makes it so effective because you just really you, you just start to think about Lady Maria or about, um, uh, oh my gosh, what's the hunter's name? Who, uh, what's the, who's like the crippled hunter who doesn't have a leg? Anyway, there's some crazy theories about him. Oh, Gehrman? Gehrman. Oh my gosh, yeah. Gehrman. Um, yeah. And the moon presence with the umbilical cords. It's just like, right. Um, that's so effective and that's totally Lovecraft. And I'm sure there's like, hundreds of youtube videos just about that maybe not hundreds i'm exaggerating but um (laughs) i'm sure there's plenty of youtube videos about um how that uh, lovecraft's fridge horror translate cosmic horror translates to bloodborne and how bloodborne does that effectively so uh, i love that game so much so good (laughs) <laughs> you're, you're calling it fridge horror is that what you're saying yeah fridge horror like... fridge horror is kind of an interesting trope it's um it's this uh it's it's kind of a simplifying hp lovecraft's horror but it's based basically what it means is when you're in the present moment of a movie or of a television scene or of a book um mm-hmm. it's not terrifying and you're not really thinking about it but the more you think about it and the more you connect the dots then it becomes horrifying. And that's okay. that's kind of what Bloodborne's all about. Because when you're in the moment, 
um, and you're discovering this world, it's not, it, it's terrifying, but when you really think about it after the fact, like about the nightmare realms and all of that, it really, and you really connect the dots with all the item descriptions, that's when you kind of have these crazy, horrifying epiphanies. Like, oh my god, I didn't know that. Oh my god, the the doll in the dream could be Lady Maria or something. It's just like... Right. <laughs> so... Oh, shit. You should... <laughs> You should make a video on that. Because <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't think I've seen anyone talk about it like that. Like, obviously, there are the lore videos, mm. which help explain what's going on. But no one's ever been like, oh, that's how the horror, like, structurally works in this game. You know, obviously, things are creepy looking, but. Well, I will, ta- I will take you up on that. Maybe I'll make a Bloodborne <laughs> video. <laughs> so. I don't know what. I mean, I guess I'm sure there are movies who do the same thing. So you could probably tie that in if you want to keep the theme going but yeah i would have to think about that gosh there, there's there's nothing like lovecraft is there <laughs> so <laughs> no. yeah um are there any lovecraft like explicit lovecraft movie adaptations oh my gosh i think john carpenter did one believe it or not um oh, okay it was with sam neil i think it was <laughs> what was it i think it was mountains of madness uh I ne- really yeah i never saw it but I mean, I love John Carpenter, and uh, The Thing, in a way, is its own Lovecraft sci-fi movie, so maybe it's good. I don't know. I should check it out. I, I know that Guillermo del Toro was trying to make a Lovecraft movie for the longest time, but I don't know. Yeah, I remember. I don't think, yeah, I don't think that's going anywhere. Yeah, that's not no. going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> right. Just like, uh, what is it, uh, Terry Gilliam's... Uh, Don Quixote or whatever. Oh yeah, that, that's that. Not... <laughs> he actually started filming that, and it never, it never happened. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, that might not. <laughs> but uh, Terry Gilliam, what is that guy up to these days? I haven't seen a movie from him in a while. <laughs> not making Don Quixote, yeah. and <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he had a movie a few years ago. I didn't see it, but uh, I think it was about some guy in a techno it was kind of like uh what's that oh frick wasn't it wasn't it one the one with christoph Waltz, uh the zero theorem it was kind of like uh brazil but like more techie right right yeah. i think so yeah i never i never saw it i wanted to i just never got around to it mm-hmm. I, I think it didn't get a wide release which i mean for a guy like terry gilliam i feel like that's getting harder and harder to do with, right so in this current Hollywood climate of Disney, Star Wars, Marvel machine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, you talk about that in your uh, most recent video, the Titanfall one. And I definitely have to agree on the uninteresting aesthetic of the Marvel movies. Do you have anything to say more about that to elaborate on yes i do um I'm oh, always, please. I, I love to i love talking about marvel um uh, actually i cannot tell you the name of this youtuber but i i saw a youtube video that i thought was pretty interesting about marvel movies and it was about how all of the color grading and color correction is the same in every marvel movie to give them the same you know aesthetic <laughs> i think i saw that too yeah yeah that was such a oh my gosh that that video really made me just open my eyes. I mean, like, right. I mean, I was able to articulate what I was already thinking perfectly. And mm-hmm. I'm just like, I can't, I just can't take that uninspired aesthetic. And the worst thing is, is that you're starting to see it in Star Wars movies, too. It's just, I don't know, there's something, I mean, I'm not going to support George Lucas's prequels, but... <laughs> At, the, at, the... at least <laughs> at least they had some color at least they had some color right but like right. these disney movies ah, they just look so bland and these star wars movies mm-hmm. they they also feel bland um the i was so pleasantly surprised by how much i liked logan mm-hmm. um i don't know if you saw logan yet um, i have not but i want to well it's actually a very good movie because um the studios which i believe was fox they just kind of let Mm -hmm. james mangold the director do whatever he wanted and to give it its own feel (laughs) and that's why it's it's a good movie because it doesn't feel like assembly line disney you know garbage so (laughs) so so yeah or like 
or like early 2000s fx yeah. like that they had they all had a style thanks to the matrix that kind of ruined things for a few years that's but true. now it's now it's the marvel yeah yeah oh my gosh i don't know i just and um i feel bad for all those indie filmmakers who are trying to get their movies shown because these this freaking disney star wars machine is just cranking out movies every week so so it's just it's just every year come on it's just, they've got a whole 364 days <laughs> <laughs> to get their movie out what are you complaining about <laughs> true 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 i don't know i don't know i'm just uh i'm just complaining too much i'm i'm just that's just how i feel about movies um yeah i don't know there, I mean, there you go I, <laughs> I mean i guess you have a point though that like I mean, this is just a general problem in like this semi post scarcity world. Um, we're not really there, but you know, at least on the internet age, we have so much stuff to do and watch and read and listen to and everything. So, like, being an indie movie maker now must be like such a daunting task because, like, how are people going to watch your thing when they have literally everything else to watch? Yeah, that's you know? true. Um, the good news is is that uh, television right now is really doing a pretty great job supporting new filmmakers and new ideas, which mm -hmm. is why I find myself watching television a lot more. Um, hmm. There's just a, there's a lot of a lot of great stuff. I just finished watching. Uh, I'm all caught up with the Americans, which was fantastic, and now I'm watching The Leftovers, which is also really good. So. Um, a lot of the best content right now is actually in television, and um, a lot of a lot of indie filmmakers who have that one indie gem, they they're starting to make television shows. They're pitching television shows, like uh, the guy who did the movie Dear White People just made a TV show oh, yeah. called Dear White People, right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, another another. Um, indie filmmaker, the one who did About Earth, I cannot remember her name off the top of my head, but or no, it was not not called About Earth. What was it? Another Earth. Sorry, I'm mixing my words up. It's the it's the Mexican heat. I'm sorry, it's all the Mexican heat that's making me. <laughs> By the way, I'm in Mexico. How... Right. How? What is the temperature right now? Uh, that is a good question. Um, enough to make me sweat. Um, gotcha. <laughs> is that enough for you to know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's fine i yeah. hope there's a fan near you or some form of ac or at least like some leaves that you're you know well, fanning your face with thank, thank, thank goodness i have leaves thank goodness I have leaves. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um but yeah going uh, back going back like the the person who did another earth she did a tv show called the oa on netflix and mm -hmm. uh so yeah like my point is is that indie filmmakers are it seems like either turning to television or getting lucky and making a big a big pirates of the caribbean blockbuster so <laughs> right uh, yeah so there you go that's that's the nature of the industry from from what i see <laughs> I, I feel like that doesn't necessarily help though like okay instead of making a 90 minute movie let's make a four-hour television show like that seems kind of backwards in terms of just getting people to see all of your you know work i mean netflix is obviously nice and gives you a large base audience immediately um but whether or not they watch it you know i guess uh sense eight that show just right. got canceled um you know only after two seasons so i feel like maybe eventually we'll start seeing the competition taking its toll yeah there there are some limitations to television which are kind of bad um like what you said with Sensei, Netflix, especially recently, has been canceling a lot of shows prematurely. So mm -hmm. a lot of TV shows will get their first act with the first season and then the, the beginning of the second act with the second season and then the show's canceled. So so it's like right, right. right when the rising action occurs is when these shows get canceled. And it's just uh, that... In a way, it makes me miss the cohesiveness of a 90-minute, 100-minute movie. A nice right. beginning, middle, and end, um, which is unfortunately not happening as much with TV shows, especially once they get canceled. So Yeah. 
So yeah. And it's it's even worse with Netflix because it's like you, like you release the one season in a block, and you don't even have you can't even like make an ending if they cancel it after that right like it's not like oh mid-season uh let's throw some together which granted probably wouldn't be great either but at least would give you a chance to conclude instead of just oh yep nope there's nothing after this sorry (laughs) sorry (laughs) (laughs) yeah um no yeah it's uh i don't know i don't know what to say all i'll say is that the one network that seems to be getting it right now is fx fx is really cranking out really good shows and the americans which is an example of a really good show on fx right now the ratings for that show are really low but (laughs) fx has so much integrity that they're going to let them finish the show and not cancel it prematurely because they're on their fifth season so they're giving it one last season which I feel like, okay. which I feel like is how it should be done, and not the Netflix way, which is just cancel it prematurely. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's just better to the fans, you know, and probably brings more goodwill to them oh, instead yeah. of, yeah. I mean, Netflix obviously has like basically nothing to lose because they're running like everything now in terms of <laughs> visual media, <laughs> but um, you know, it's just a nice gesture. <laughs> it is a nice gesture. I agree. Um, yeah. yeah. Anyway, how 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 was how's uh, your day been? <laughs> how's my day? It's all right. I worked. Uh, you know, I prepared for this. I'm doing it. You know. I dig that. Uh, yeah. What was your day like? Um, the day of the day of Mexico. Well, maybe this is an inch. Even though it's supposed to be about video games. Um, it is, it is kind of interesting because uh, I, I did this YouTube channel in 2016 and I made 13 videos and now I'm on a brief hiatus working in a university in Mexico and uh, my typical day is um, going to the university. I have to take a bus and I'm usually at the university for about seven to eight hours, so sometimes even less, so I have a pretty laid back life and... I teach film classes, I teach English classes, and I'm also developing something called a makerspace, which is like a little a little room. <laughs> That's what we have. Usually it's bigger, but it's a room in our case that has a 3D printer, CNC machine, laser cutter, and it's just a place where students can come to do their own projects. So my job is to help integrate that into the school curriculum. So... So yeah, that's that's my life in a nutshell. <laughs> that that sounds rad as shit. <laughs> it's it's cool. It's cool. <laughs> How did um? So I watched the documentary that you made. I think you made. I assume you made oh, on your channel. Oh, the Cuba documentary. Yeah. Yes. I made that I a just, few years ago. <laughs> I just figured. I was like, well, it's on the channel. I guess I should see what it is. And like, it's a pretty competently made documentary i was like oh wow he's actually you're a pretty good filmmaker Thanks, and uh, i appreciate that <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh i thought you were gonna be because did you say you were gonna be in brazil before or is it just mexico um i think it was just mexico um okay i mean i'm just i mean yeah. i just like <laughs> I, I would like to learn Portuguese, but I don't, I don't know <laughs> what it is about the accent. It's just, I don't know. I don't get it. it, it <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a nice language. I just don't know if I want to learn it. Spanish is mm-hmm. a little bit more doable. Um, I would love to learn Italian. So, may, so maybe I said one time I didn't want to go to Brazil, but except that I want to go to Italy or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just, no, I just mixed it up. I just like, go oh, Brazil. People play games there. I don't know. It was weird. Uh, <laughs> but I thought uh, before you just told me that you're there for university, I thought you were making another documentary. But I guess that's not the case. Uh, <laughs> no, it's um, I'm taking more of a teacher role right now, which which has been good. Um, I haven't really taught film before. I, I did a film workshop in El Salvador, um, mm-hmm. wh- which which is where I lived before i was i was there as a peace corps volunteer for two years so um there i did some film workshops but i've never actually taught film 
as a part of the curriculum before, and it, it's been pretty cool. I mean, I get to talk about Wong Kar Wai and how he uses color, and I get to talk about the Coen brothers, all of my favorite things. So, mm. <laughs> so it's fun. I yep. like it. What is the class uh, like? Does it have a? Is it a specific class, or just like film one hundred and one, or what is it? Um, right now, it's it's about how to use it, it's a lot of it's about cinematography so that's mm-hmm. that's pretty much what the class is about so we we i teach lighting i teach color and i teach teach composition which is okay which is pretty cool um i it kind of lets me show off all of the youtubers i like to because i like a lot <laughs> of film youtubers so we get a chance to watch a lot of videos and discuss them afterwards um which is fun which is fun so, yeah. um, the one bad thing about being here is that unfortunately video games aren't as big a part of my life as they were before, which is very sad. It's very I'm sad. Sorry. It's, 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 <laughs> there's so many games I want to play too, like Resident Evil 7. Oh my God, Resident Evil 7 right. looks so good. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dude, but, this year has been a glut of games. It's ridiculous. Like, I thought my backlog was big before. It's like, oh, this year's just, it multiplied two times over. Great, thanks. Oh my gosh. what Have, have you played any games this year, or are you still caught up in your black, uh, backlog? Um. I don't was was the last Guardian twenty seventeen or is that twenty sixteen? That, that that was twenty sixteen. So. Well, okay, it was the end of it, so basically twenty seventeen. <laughs> so the last Guardian. <laughs> um, what else? I don't know. Uh, I guess the Battlegrounds. I don't know if you've heard of that one, the multiplayer oh, game. Oh yeah, that's, how... that's like yeah. That, that was kind of an overnight success, right? Wasn't it just made right. by some random guy? I don't know. Um, yeah, it was like an Arma three mod, or it was like a mod from an arma 3 mod it was weird uh but yeah so i've been playing a bit of that with some friends but and the new walking dead season from telltale i'm keeping up with this keep keeping up with gosh just because my friend plays it so we kind of have discussed that every you know month that it comes out but otherwise yeah it's just kind of the backlog uh what season of telltale are they on of uh walking they, dead they are on three. Oh, they're on three oh. yeah did it live up to the hype? Is it as good as the first season? Um, I mean, no. <laughs> what? What kind of question is that? No. <laughs> God, I mean that like that game was such a sea change. Yeah, for, that's true. You know, storytelling, honestly, uh, you know, in that sort of style, like it's been so influential. And I guess it was sort of influenced by like BioWare, you know, discussion systems and yeah, stuff like yeah. that. But um, you know, making it so you know not rpg ish and just kind of having decisions have consequences immediately instead of like oh i got renegade points all <laughs> yeah. right um Which... speaking of mass effect um that 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 was kind of a disaster wasn't it <laughs> the andromeda <laughs> yeah what, what... oh yeah a bit <laughs> yeah a bit um I, that was fun following um for i haven't played the game but just watching mm-hmm. YouTube videos about it and reading articles about it, just like following that disaster from beginning to end was really fascinating. Um, yeah. Like, especially considering that I, I can name at least a few friends, no, a handful of friends that I have who are diehard Mass Effect fr- fans and just seeing them right. going from being so hyped to <laughs> it's, it's actually really good to okay maybe it's not good to oh my god this, what a disappointment <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> just seeing that just like the five steps of grief or whatever happening it was so funny. yeah yeah denial <laughs> yeah <laughs> denial to acceptance <laughs> right um yeah unfortunately people had to ruin it and harass the creators about it so that's cool but, yeah that's true you know yeah yeah, they brought you, you, the whole uh, SJW thing into it, which I feel like is totally inappropriate. But um, that's the internet. <laughs> so yeah. Um, Wait, do you mean like the the people, the oh the like the dissenters were saying like they were making people, like they did bad facial animation because SJWs? Like, is there a conspiracy or something? I don't I don't know. There's just um the the creator of Mass Effect was um. 
he, he was very outspoken. Um, he, he was an, he like he had an outspoken agenda, let's say, and mm-hmm. a lot of S, um, a lot of people were were calling him out as being like, "Oh, SJWs shouldn't make games anymore. They're ruining the industry." And now the new Far Cry game has this promo, and it's like, "Ah, oh, SJWs! Oh, you're destroying white yeah. power!" And it's just like. Wait what? <laughs> just like the, or 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 the just like the stupidest things. I don't know. I just yeah. I just don't understand um, all of this bizarre controversy that's happening in games. Like the like games are very political now, and it's it's just so bizarre. I don't really understand it. Um, so yeah. Are are you? I I don't think you'd be against the politics. I mean, you watch film clearly that uh has some politics in it uh yeah no i'm not i'm just uh, i don't know i just um maybe not the politics in the games but like the people surrounding them and sort of the bickering about it yeah i don't know to me this it's just a lot of it's just very toxic let's put it that way just um i just i just hate reading these comments um, and some of this new vocabulary that's coming out, like leftist cucks or late late tars, <laughs> right, like, right. It's just, beta. It's just the stupidest shit. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. Am I allowed to swear on this podcast? My bad. <laughs> so it's just like the fuck. St- yeah, you can swear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I hope I'm not losing subscribers. I hope there aren't people who are like, oh man. Uh, it's not just a video game; it's an SJW snowflake. Oh no! Right. It's like it's not. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's a hard tight. Uh, I mean, do you want those people though? That's, like, that's a good point. I don't want those you know, people. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, without veering too much into politics, even though Donald Trump just made a crazy decision today. Um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Um, let's talk about video games. Um. Oh yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I got some questions written down here. I forgot. Uh, so what got you into games in the first place as a youngin, or maybe a few years ago as an oldie? You're not old, but that that's actually a, a very interesting question because my life applies to both of those points. Um, like me getting into video games as a as a youngin. And me getting into video games later in life as an olden, if you will. <laughs> um, as a youngin, I, I, my parents bought me an N64 when I was seven, which mm-hmm. I feel like was a blessing and a curse. Um, a curse in the, fa- in the fact that um, I never read. I just never read books. And I was just yeah. like very distracted. <laughs> with video games the the silver lining is is that golden eye was the best thing ever so um so yeah i, I was just i was a huge rareware fan i just loved mm-hmm. loved everything rareware um golden eye perfect dark conquers bad fur day banjo kazooie blast core uh donkey kong like rare rareware was basically my childhood yeah um which is a bummer because ukulele was a disappointment from what I've heard, which was the rare, rare revival. Uh, but I've heard both good and bad things. It's very confusing. Um, but yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. I'm going to probably play it sometime soon. So, um, mm-hmm. but yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I was a huge fan, so I'm sure I'll at least find a charming ukulele. Um, right. As an adult, I got back into video games because there was a while where I wasn't playing video games. When I was in, okay. when I was in college, I didn't really play games. But after college, um, I think the games that got me back into gaming were Bioshock Infinite and The Last of Us, which I played oh, at yeah. like around the same time. And then I got obsessed mm-hmm. with video games again. I was like, oh my gosh, video games have evolved so much. I cannot believe this. Um, so yeah, that, those were kind of the, it's kind of interesting how, how like between 2009, 2013 ish, I just didn't really play games. Um, Mm -hmm. and then I took them back up again. So interesting how life works like that. Yeah. Yeah. Are those, are those birds? Yeah. Yeah. Um, (laughs) fun fact, um, there are birds where I live and they, they're usually, they're usually pretty quiet. 
Uh, uh-huh. Hopefully, they aren't. I don't think my audio is catching them, but okay. But yeah, I, I have uh, tropical birds. Um, Fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's kind of my interesting, semi-interesting gaming phases that I've gone through. So, yeah. So. And what got you into movies in the first place? I mean, obviously those are pretty ubiquitous for most people, but like, you know, what was the first movie that made you really fall in love with them? Oh yeah. The, I can name the first movie that made me fall in love with movies was Lawrence of Arabia. Which, oh wow. Which is, uh, how, old, how old were you? I was seventh grade, eighth grade. So pretty young. What the f- what seventh graders like? Oh, Lords of Arabia, my favorite. My uh, dad, my dad showed it to me, and it was beautiful, and I just couldn't believe it. And yeah. I mean, of course, like I watched other movies that seventh graders watch, like Quentin Tarantino movies. But um, but yeah, that was like the first movie I was like, whoa, this is like I, I didn't understand the politics of it at the time, but oh my gosh, like mm-hmm. those shots of the desert, I couldn't believe it, and the music, it was just it was just gorgeous, and. Um, I, then I started watching a lot of Af- Alfred Hitchcock, like Vertigo, mm. you know. And as a as a freaking eighth grader, you're watching Alfred Hitchcock. What? They're entertaining. <laughs> I, it's just like cool. Like I wanted to be that. I'm watching freaking like I'm trying to even think like Fast and Furious one and like oh, I mean oh, people, no. you know. It's just like uh, yeah. I, I wish I could go back and be like, here's some cool shit. Start watching this. Well, I, to be fair, to be totally fair, I feel like a lot of movies that you watch when you're a kid or any books you read as a kid, once you become a certain age and you watch it again or read it again, that's when mm. you truly understand it and truly get it. Um, right. So in a way, it's a blessing. Like, I mean, Vertigo was amazing when I saw it when I was in eighth grade, but it was even more amazing when I saw it in college and I, I was able to catch all the subtext. So, right. um, in a way, as seeing it as an adult is more rewarding. So, well, that, yeah, that's true. As a kid, like, yeah, if there's something I've seen it as a kid, it's like I didn't actually see it. You know, right. like now, I don't know if I like it or not. I just know some things about it. But yeah, that's yeah. I mean, they, I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, what other notes do you have written down? <laughs> Um, let me see. Uh, so you had your brother make a video on the channel, which is pretty interesting that you brought in someone else to make a video. Uh, does he have his own channel? You know, um, that was kind of, uh, he does not have his own channel. Um, it was kind of Mm -hmm. funny because when I was making, I was going to make a video and I couldn't think of a video and I wanted to stay on schedule because at that time in my life, I wanted to release a video every two weeks. And okay. uh, my brother was really into the evil within. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to try something new and just see what happens. <laughs> so so we just decided to go for it and um, just make that video. I mean, of course, it's not like it's not like my best work, but <laughs> but it was. <laughs> It was something I wanted to try just to see how it would be like vo- voicing somebody else's ideas. Um, mm-hmm. I, I love The Evil Within. It's a really good game. Um, but my brother was like a huge fan of Evil Within. So right. I was like, you know what? Screw it. You do this video. <laughs> of course, I was... I helped him write the script. Okay. So yeah, yeah. Because the thing is, is that my brother, like when he turned in the script for the first time, it was like three pages long which would have been like a 20 minute video. So I'm like, wait, listen, what's what spacing was he using? Like one? Yeah. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> but even like, okay. even like, um, like single and a half is still yeah. like a page of that is still like about seven, eight minutes to be honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, right. again, that depends on how you edit the video. I like to edit sure. my video with a lot of, um, examples from yeah so that takes up screen time but somebody another youtuber like like the nerd writer for example um mm-hmm. he pretty much talks over his video from beginning to end so i'm sure his scripts are a little bit longer um but but yeah um so yeah i, I let him do it which was pretty fun it was a fun little one-offer 
so <laughs> is he willing to make any more uh i don't know if i want him to make more uh <laughs> okay. I well mean, yeah fuck him i don't care <laughs> <laughs> i don't think he's interested in making any more um mm-hmm. it was fun that he did that um but I, I i think i would rather just to keep doing my own thing at this point so right yeah i'm, I'm sure it's kind of tough to co-write a script like a friend of like i make some videos and a friend of mine was like oh let me help you with one i'm like that i don't know if that even sounds like an enjoyable experience you know <laughs> it's co- collaborations <laughs> a tough thing um yeah because the thing is is that like a good collaboration i feel like is maybe somebody writes the script the other person looks it over and maybe gives them some constructive criticism and then um and then maybe the other person edits it but it's still kind of uh, kind of sticky because say like both of those people have a certain ego and mm-hmm. and they're like no it should be done this way and then the other person's right. like no it should be done that way and then it kind of becomes a compromise and it becomes m- more stressful than it's worth so sometimes yeah. it's just better just to do your own video and just not worry about it and maybe show it to friends to get constructive criticism but yeah collaboration especially for youtubers collaboration sometimes is just not even necessary so yeah um, or it ends up just like they make one joke or something like on yeah actu- on youtube videos where it's like it's me featuring skizzy bob and he's like Duh. and that's it it's like <laughs> oh great collaboration guys real or- real enjoyable I guess another time a collaboration would be good would be if it's like an interview, uh, convers- like, like a conversation between two people, like Half in right. the Bag, uh, Red mm-hmm. Letter Media. I mean, those yeah. guys are just two guys talking, and somebody's editing it in a pretty, in a pretty straightforward fashion. There's not a whole lot of creativity. It's just about discussion. Um, then mm-hmm. it's fine, but yeah, typically it's not a good idea. So yeah, <laughs> but the, I guess the thing I. I like I I've seen like almost every lead red letter media video, but so it's like good. <laughs> <laughs> they are. But at the same time, it's kind of I don't know. They you know they don't write anything down. They don't write a script. Right. So it sort of feels undercooked. Like it's just sort of a very general discussion about something, and I'm kind of like veering away that towards that. Like not veering away from that. Sorry. Uh, so, like, you know, someone like Chris Stuckman or um, Jeremy Johns, I think. Yeah. Uh, you know, they review movies, but it's, you know, it's the normal review template of just, like, oh, it's got good writing, and, you know, keep going. It's like, what does that even mean? Like, tell me. Yeah. Like, I, I want to get into the nitty-gritty, and, you know, Red Letter Media sort of falls into that, where it's like, oh, this movie's good, it's got good pacing and stuff. It's like, all right, I get it, you know. I don't really need to, especially if it's a movie that I'm interested in seeing. I feel like those are the most unnecessary reviews. But if it's like, um, you know, Paul Blart, Mall Cop, like, yes, I'll watch that review. Of course. I would love to watch that. Well, with re- with Red Letter Media, I didn't get it. Even though I do like Half in the Bag and I do like Best of the Worst and all that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. The reason why I love Red Letter Media is for the Plinkett reviews. Um, oh, yeah. I mean, that that's where all the, the creativity comes from. But, but yeah, I do agree with you. There's a lot of reviews that are just so generic and um sometimes when you say oh yeah the pacing is good it's just there's no context to that statement it's just no. very generic and there are some youtubers who really really dig deep um i think my favorite is probably every frame of painting um, oh yeah he's he's the best he only has like 20 videos but every video is great um yeah he needs to make a video i'm pretty sure he's a patreon yeah. And he could get like four thousand dollars or something. <laughs> <laughs> well well what I like about what I like about every frame of painting, and this is my biggest criticism of the nerd writer, which is he's the nerd writer is pretty similar to every frame of painting and I they're friends to the nerd writer and Tony Show. Oh really? Um yeah, yeah, they are well they're like acquaintances. I wouldn't say they're friends. But um right. uh nerd writer, he has he 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 releases a video every week. And sometimes his videos feel a little undercooked, like yeah. like they're good, but they could be better. And every frame of painting, what I love about him is that he really takes his time. Like you can tell yeah. that he doesn't release a video until it's finished. 
which is I just which is why they're this so next good. video this next video better be like forty minutes and amazing because it's been like eight months. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, to be fair, I, I think my favorite video of his, and it's it's kind of half assed, but it's really fascinating. It's his uh, three minute video of Silence of the Lambs. It's it's only three minutes yeah. long. But the way mm-hmm. he just dissects every shot is really interesting. <laughs> so, yeah. so in a way, like I love his brevity. So, if if it's only a three minute video, but it's like the best three minute video ever, <laughs> I'm okay with that. Right. <laughs> so, like his his videos are so endlessly rewatchable because a he's pulling from some great movies that you want to watch, right? And he edits them so well and has such interesting things to say about them. He's the best. He is. He's the one that everyone aspires towards. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, what else? Yeah, I mean, I think those are those probably cover my favorite YouTubers. To be honest, I mean, mm-hmm. um, nerd writer. Who are your favorite? Uh, who are your favorite gaming YouTubers? I don't know. If... Oh, that's a good question. Um, this is gonna. This this might kind of annoy you, but I really like PewDiePie. Them. Not PewDiePie, not PewDiePie. <laughs> um, I really like his sense of humor, and it's just like so stupid and so light. But at the same time, I feel like he's really good at exposing. Um, he, he's really good at exposing games that just simply don't work. He even made mm-hmm. he made a Last Guardian video, which was really funny. <laughs> um, video game donkey. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's really funny. <laughs> Um, really dumb, but really funny. Um, I also started watching this YouTuber who is fascinating. Um, I think I'm pronouncing it right. It's like Crobe Cat. Crobe Cat. Have you Crobe Cat? No, I have not. Um, he makes really interesting videos, um, that, uh, have no voiceover. He doesn't have any voiceover in his videos, but he just does a lot of juxtapositions. Mm -hmm. Um, for example, he he did a Ubi, an Ubisoft video where he was comparing what was promised to what we actually got, ah. and, uh, <laughs> and 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 then he like he, he'll edit these interviews um, showing these these developers making all these promises, <laughs> and then he'll just like show like what act we actually got, and they're very clever and very funny. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I'm trying to think of other ones. A lot of my the YouTubers I watch are actually film YouTubers. Um, what are some are those, What are some recommendations oh, you have? Um, I've got a few, but so would you say that the film YouTubers are what got you into the essay scene? Like, it wasn't gaming specifically. You just happened to want to tie games to film and. That that's pretty much that's pretty much exactly right. Um, okay. I mean, I, I I do like a lot of gaming YouTubers, as I said. I mean, like Crobe Cat, Video Game Donkey. I mean, not like super serious ones, but <laughs> right. um, but um, the ones that I really, the, the ones that really got me into it were the film ones. Yeah. Um, I can't. I cannot hide that. I just love. Fil- I just love film YouTubers. Um. Another one I failed to mention, which is who's really fascinating, is is Cinefix. Um, Cinefix has a lot of great stuff. Oh my gosh! Um, yeah, I mean the film YouTubers are are the best. I love them. But then again, I haven't been as exposed as I could be to video game YouTubers. Um, mm. So, give me well, some recommendations, I, please. If I yeah, uh, <laughs> I can give you a few. Um, I mean, I feel like. I don't know what you know, cause, but I'll say some obvious ones that are obvious to me, at least, you know, they're kind of bigger, but, uh, you've got errant signal campster. Um, he's good. A very, you know, literary sort of look, you know, try and take the mechanics and, you know, the visuals and stuff like that, tie it all together to figure out the meaning of a game. Um, let's see who else. Um, I can't believe I haven't heard of this guy. <laughs> i'm such a bad youtuber i'm sorry i just uh, apparently I, I, apparently i don't i don't and know in your own scene in like my this is your scene. scene it's it's like it's like it's like asking keith richards like what do you what do you think of uh, robert plant and uh, led zeppelin like what do you think of them and then it's like oh i don't i have no idea 
who are those guys? <laughs> not that I'm right. saying that I'm Keith Richards. I'm definitely not no. Keith Richards. I'm not cool enough to be him. So, right. <laughs> but um, who else? Let's see. Do you like uh, Jim Sterling? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's obviously more about the industry and the things happening around games rather than the games themselves. But yeah. yeah. He always has a good time. Yeah, he's fun to watch. I like him. He, he can be kind of irritating, but I feel like that's <laughs> that's part of his personality. Yeah. So I can't really blame him. That's kind of his character. So his shtick. So. Yeah. Um, uh, I also recommend uh, the channel Writing on Games. Writing on Games. I've heard of that yeah. one. I have not watched it. I should. He's he's an up and comer. I mean, now he's got like fifty thousand subscribers, but I found him when he only had like one, and it happened in a period of like half a year. So, and he's good. I need to watch these guys. I need to research more video game YouTubers. I feel terrible. You should edit. Here's what you, here's, you should, here's what you do. What what do I do? You just look at my subscriber list, like who I'm subscribed to on my on the channel that this podcast will be uploaded to. And that's a lot of them. That's most of them. <laughs> okay, I gotta, I gotta watch them. Um, though, though, I do recommend that you edit this whole section out because I want, I want people thinking, <laughs> oh my god, this guy doesn't know anything about freaking YouTube video get videos. I don't know. I feel like it's an interesting <laughs> thing to know. You know. I don't know. It's a part of the whole. It's the whole package of who Oren is. Yeah. As a YouTuber. No. Yeah. You need to include every little aspect. To to uh, expose the man behind the videos. Um, I mean, that's that's kind of the purpose, you know. I mean, I'm not trying to be like, what are your deepest, darkest secrets? But I, I, you know, just to... I really love cats. I love cats. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. No, I mean, I like cats. I wouldn't say I love them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> They're cool. <laughs> they are cool. They're pretty chill. Um, yeah. Dogs are very attention seeking and they're mm-hmm. they're pretty high maintenance, but cats you they just don't give a fuck. They just Right. So I appreciate they're, that. They're like the best Tamagotchi. Like all you have to do is put out food and that's it. That's true. It's true. <laughs> it's true. It's sad that I have to compare animals to Tamagotchi. Like that's how <laughs> that's my that's my lens for animals. It's like, oh, video games. Uh Pokemon? It's like a Pokemon, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know um I, I don't know why this reminds me of this because like but um um you, you said pokemon so for mm-hmm. some reason i thought of my friends in mexico who love pokemon so i'm thinking oh my gosh mexicans they love pokemon but they also love video <laughs> games Me- mexicans are huge gamers yeah. um yeah i they are obsessed with uh with gaming culture um which is great. How is so? How is the market down there? Like in terms of console prices and you know availability. That's and that's a great question. Um, because of the taxes and the the trading, um, mm-hmm. the uh, Nintendo Switch here is ten thousand pesos, which if you translate that to dollars is five hundred dollars. Oh, uh, it's bad. It's bad. Yeah. <laughs> and like, and we can barely get them here. I don't imagine there's there's probably more than like five in Mexico, like in total. That's the all the switches there are. <laughs> yeah, I mean sometimes I um I just walk around gaming stores just to browse, and mm-hmm. if they have one in stock, it's a big deal. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it's also ten thousand pesos, which right everything. Yeah, the g- gaming is. There are some things that are super cheap in Mexico, like mm-hmm. um. Like going to the movies, a movie theater ticket is like 35 pesos, 40 pesos, which is like $2. Are you serious? I am serious. What the hell? <laughs> I, Freaking 15 bucks here. That I know. It's, it's great. It's really great. I see a movie like every week, um, even if they're bad. Um, but that Because it, <laughs> it doesn't matter. It, yeah, it doesn't two bucks. matter. I mean, yeah, I'm wasting my time, but I'm not wasting my money. Um, yeah. And but yeah, video games here are so expensive. Um, a PlayStation Four is eight thousand pesos, which is four hundred dollars. Which is insane. how the hell is a Switch more than a PS Four? 
That's a good question. That's that's <laughs> disgusting. I mean, it's isn't a Nintendo Switch basically a Legend of Zelda machine? Oh, yeah. Burn. Oh, I don't. I don't think anyone even has a problem with that. Like, <laughs> just say yeah. Oh, and sorry, one two switch. Oops, can't forget that. <laughs> oh yeah, that's oh yeah, that's that's the reason why I bought this three hundred dollar console. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or in the or case, five hundred dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, uh, The Legend of Zelda is a pretty big deal here. A lot of mm-hmm. a lot of my students complain to me that they haven't played Breath of the Wild yet because <laughs> the game itself is really expensive too. Um, can't remember the exact price, but it's definitely over the $50, $60 price tag. Um, right. So, so yeah, a lot of Legend of Zelda fans. Um, um, yeah. Uh, the the peop- maybe it's because I'm working at an animation slash film slash engineering university, a polytechnic mm-hmm. university. Um, okay. But there's a lot of nerds at that university, <laughs> and they're all obsessed with video that, games. So <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so so yeah. What would you? So I'm going to shoot a question at you. Um, of, okay. Of all. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first, this is like a like a, a question that doesn't have anything to do with your channel, but I will get to your okay. channel. Um, mm-hmm. What would you say of all the games that have come out this year? What would you say is your most anticipated to play? Oh shoot! Um, I have to look at a list. I will edit out the downtime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh uh, games. There's probably so many. Uh, Night in the Woods looks fun. Night in the Woods looks fun. I mean, that's more of a narrative uh, game. I think, like, I want to play the big... Get out of here. Ad blocker. Uh, I want to play the big ones, like, you know, Breath of the Wild. But it's like, they take such big time commitments and... Yeah, there's there's so many 100 plus hour games coming out this year, um, yeah. like Persona Five. Yeah, right. Oh For, yeah. Forget that. I have like a, I'd love to. <laughs> I, I'd love to, but I have a life. <laughs> right, and there's like, and people are like, yeah, I want to talk about all three of them. It's like, how are you physically doing this? How can you play through all these games? <sighs> there are just some oh. people who who that's the game they play like, like right. persona is the game they play and maybe they break that up with playing fifa or something but yeah <laughs> yeah um there oh cuphead if that's coming out oh my gosh that, that thing's still a thing cuphead. yeah <laughs> <laughs> hopefully i mean like i don't care if it's boring i i want to just look at it for a while you know just play through that world i almost feel like cuphead's the kind of game that i wouldn't play i would just watch youtube videos about and be like whoa so pretty yeah (laughs) (laughs) um this list isn't enticing me too much uh i guess uh rhyme uh that came out recently you know obviously it's got its you know that game company and uh team Ico uh, influence, but any game that's influenced by that is probably okay with me. So I would say it's okay with me too. Yeah. <laughs> also, uh, the game Pray for the Gods. It was a Kickstarter game, uh, very influenced by Shadow of the Colossus. You play as you know, you just fight giant beasts sort of in this open world, uh, but it also has survival elements, I guess, which seems interesting. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely interested in that the only problem with that game and wait by the way i think they changed the title for that game yeah i think they like respelled prey to be like p-r-a-e-y right just yeah yeah because bethesda was not having it and being like oh it sounds like prey it's like it's the same what? thing <laughs> no it's not <laughs> god damn it just because like there's that uh there's a card game called scrolls and they're like no it's elder scrolls man someone's <laughs> gonna get it confused 
or like they abbreviate our game to scrolls and it's going to be it's just going to be a mess don't do it please you, you um, know Beth- yeah. bethesda is kind of kind of an anomaly sometimes because because i really love their games um i really mm-hmm. love their games but some of their policies like their review policy and mm-hmm. how they sue other people over over um the, the name of the game or whatever it's just like so bizarre i, I don't i don't yeah. understand it um so but i do love their games i, I mean i'm really hoping at e3 this year there's something about i don't know a doom sequel or a doom dlc fingers crossed probably, but, probably a dlc i don't think they are um there was a so there's this channel called no clip they do uh documentaries and they did an interview with the doom developers and they were it seemed like they were implying there was a sequel or something about doom coming nice. so yeah i dig that i'm excited yeah. for that <laughs> um uh, yeah e3 i'm pretty excited i mean the last of us 2 um, right god of war looks pretty cool um yeah. even i mean i could see why some people aren't too crazy about god of war because they're basically completely redefining what god of war is and making it to basically it's a last of us clone probably yeah which <laughs> i can see why people would hate that um mm-hmm. i do kind of miss just like the shameless gore <laughs> and and <laughs> And just, uh, I'm going to miss badass Kratos and crazy misogynistic Kratos. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have those, you got to have some misogynists in there. We got to represent all of them. You got you, <laughs> All walks of life. You got you, you got to, you have to be, you know, having, where's, are we going to have a sex mini game? We're not going to have a sex mini game? What the fuck? Come on. <laughs> I'm not going to have sex with Aphrodite. What? Right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I could see why some people are kind of like, eh, about God of War. Mm. I'm, I'm open to it, though. Um, yeah, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. Um, gosh, what else is going to be at E3? Uh, um, a lot of oh, stuff. I don't know. Maybe Red Dead 2? I don't know. But Rockstar is kind of notorious for not showing up at E3. Do they not? Okay. Not really. I forgot. Yeah. All right. um, a lot of good stuff. I would say those, I, I'd say my most anticipated is probably Last of Us 2, God of War. I'm also kind of interested in the new Hideo Kojima game just because it looks so oh, yeah. bizarre. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <It> looks- <laughs> like, here, here's the thing. I have a pretty high tolerance for Kojima, you know, movies in his games right so whatever he makes i'm pretty much down for you know i know it's not everyone's cup of tea but i can sit back and watch a cutscene for a good 20 minutes if it's a decent cutscene not the powerpoints uh you you just need he just needs balance you know i mean that's why a lot of people say mgs3 is the best one because it just had the perfect balance of tight storytelling that wasn't too brought down and mired in in all this other exposition exposition and and backstory and all this other stuff that isn't even important really um which is why it was pretty Mm -hmm. much the best one um i love mgs3 mgs3 is great um not too big a fan of the fourth one though (laughs) which we've already talked about to death (laughs) so right yeah Um, you said you had a, another question for me, if you'd like to lob yes. that over here. Yes, I did. Um, so what inspired you to, uh, to do this channel? How many videos have you made? First of all, I forgot to check your channel to see how many you've made at this point. Um, I only have the two like essay videos and then I've got the, uh, three interviews, but, um, I don't know, I guess like ever since I was young, I've just always been interested in critical discussion. It's weird. Like, but you know, I was reading GameSpot in like eighth grade or whatever. And like, you know, like watching video reviews on like shadow of the Colossus and Knights of the old Republic. And it was like these, all these games that some fat guy was like, Oh, they're amazing. And I was like, Oh my God, (laughs) I want to play those. I only played Cabela's hunting and 
Like, <laughs> not, you know, I, I played, like, Crash and stuff, but to see this world of amazing games and, like, you know, these big places saying they're good, you know, sort of putting this stamp of approval, which I had put so much stock into, like, that's where I kind of got started. And then, you know, eventually, like, I realized, oh, they're just random people who need to make money and the reviews aren't even that interesting. And, you know, you find, like, the YouTube community. Uh, I'm trying to think who really got me into it, I guess. Um, hmm. Well, it, for me, it's it's uh, interesting. You know oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Um, people like extra credits and Yahtzee. I don't know if you know Yahtzee Croshaw, Zero Punctuation. I love um, Yahtzee. But <laughs> I also love extra credits. Yeah. In, fa in like, fact, extra credits did a right. really great video about the, uh, game criticism that is literally, it's perfect. It, it, it talks about everything you're talking about, about how game criticism is written or used to be written. Um, <laughs> it was. Did they, did they really? I forgot. <laughs> you never saw that video? Really? Go on. It's um. You should look I, it. I up. probably did. It's just they make so many videos. You know. That's true. They make a lot of um. They make a lot of videos that don't have anything to do with games too, uh, which are kind of interesting to watch. Yeah. Um. Some really nice, straightforward history lessons. Um. Yeah. Extra credits mm. is great. Um. Zero punctuation is uh is something else. I, I love that guy. He's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Like I th like the fact that he focused so much on the narrative aspects of games and was very um what is it called? You know, you know, he went against the grain. He, you know, he didn't hold the pop. He was contrarian, I guess. I don't know if on purpose or not. But, you know, he sort of, you know, he made like, you know, the metacritic score sort of lose its I guess you know, infallibility to me as, you know, like a high school or whatever, you know, it's like, oh, here's a guy who has a pretty well-reasoned argument for why he doesn't like something. And, you know, like he doesn't like uh, GTA four and everyone was lauding that when it came out, Yeah. Um, you know, stuff like that. So that kind of, you know, broadened my perspective and I was like, oh, you know, sort of introduced the subjectivity of it all. Uh, and then, you know, you've got, like, who I said, Aaron Signal and people, yeah. like, writing on games and stuff who just kind of went more in depth. And I guess I was like, I, I've got some ideas and I kind of just want to see uh, if I could do it. So. Yeah, I, I, I dig that. Sorry, I say I dig that a lot. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> I even say oh, that. It's here fine. In <laughs> I say that a lot in Mexico too, because a lot of people are bilingual, and some people are like, "I dig that." What is like you're digging something, and I'm mm -hmm. like, "No, it's just." Some... <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah, no, oh, that's no. such a weird. That's a weird phrase for a a non-native speaker. I never really thought about that. Well, I don't. I, I want to stick but, to what, anyway. what you're talking about, but I'm going to add one more thing to that. That. In uh, in Spanish, it's yeah. really po it's really common to say "que padre," which literally means like "what a father." Uh -huh. <laughs> it's just it's just like why would you say that? Like what? Oh. what? But it means how awesome, <laughs> and that's like what it's supposed to mean. But it literally yeah. means <laughs> "what a father," <laughs> "que padre." Huh. Um, so yeah, fun little language uh, idiom thing. Um, but um, right. But yeah, I. I think that's really important what, what you're doing because I'm just so I, we need more YouTubers like that. I mean, we are, we're getting a lot more YouTubers like that in film and in video games. Yeah. But um, I just ugh, I'm so sick of the IGN review. It's just that that whole yeah. concept of reviewing a game like, oh, the, the graphics are a nine out of ten. The sound design is an eight out of ten. I liked this game. It's smooth. Nine point five out of ten. It's just like it's just like okay, give right. me something. I need more than this. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just yeah, like that's how that's how you talk with your friends. You know what I mean? Like when you first play a game, like you just sort of have these general impressions of what you like. That's kind of like 
it's kind of the red letter media template. You know, it's like these two friends who are just like, you know, bouncing off each other, what they just saw. Right. And like, you know, it's worth something in that context of like, you know, just some person that, you know, but to the general discourse, um, you know, in the public, I feel like it's kind of, it's just kind of useless, I guess. Yeah, I, I, it is. It's pretty, to be fair, to be totally fair. And hold on one second. Somebody's talking mm-hmm. outside my door. Um, I hope my audio isn't picking, picking that up. Um, oh, it's, it seems like it's calmed down. Um, I'm sorry. You might have to edit this part out. Um, <laughs> what what was the question oh. again? <laughs> uh, I was just sort of talking about like oh yeah the how the you know the IGN yeah. review yeah yeah it's yeah. um well to be fair the um the even though the red letter media v- reviews are basically just Jay and Mike just kind of bouncing off each other. I still feel like they, those mm-hmm. reviews have more substance because they actually bring up some really interesting stuff about plot points or character development or like, wait, this didn't make sense at all. Or why did this character do that? Um, which is something I feel like a lot of film critics, even professional New York times critics don't pick up on. Um, so Mm-hmm. Um, for example, I read a four star review of the new Alien Covenant movie, and it was just gushing about how okay. good it was and how it was the best movie since the second Aliens. And it's a professional film mm-hmm. critic, um, a Matt Zoller Sites, who's actually one of the best in the industry, but he was very gushy for some reason. And at least Red Letter Media, they're able to to expose even though it's basically just a conversation they're able to expose some of the bizarre plot points in those movies or the bizarre tonal issues but but yeah i mean i completely agree the ign review is just uh, i don't know we just need to get away from that and have more stuff like what you're doing more discussion based more essay based um youtubing or film criticism (laughs) Mm -hmm. so um, right did I just invent a word, YouTubing? I guess. YouTubing? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, that's that's been. I've said it. It's established. Don't worry. Because uh, I've heard YouTuber, but YouTubing, like it's like I'm doing it. Like I don't know. Yeah, you're right. I don't know. <laughs> uh but I guess you know when I criticize someone like Red Letter Media, I guess I don't like to get too bogged down and like you know there's there's sort of like the structural elements of narrative and then like the meaning of the narrative you know what i mean like that's true there's just saying like the pacing was bad versus what does the pacing say like what is what does it add to the meaning of something i guess that's what i am most interested in and not that like I wouldn't look down on someone who just, you know, looks at the structure and stuff. I mean, I guess Tony Zhao does that, you know. He doesn't, like, dissect a movie into, like, its meaning. He just sort of looks at how it was constructed, which is interesting. And he definitely is adept because he's an editor and he knows how the structure works. But I guess I just want to see more, like, oh, what is this piece saying, you know? Yeah, I mean... A good, a good person, a good filmmaker for that is Chris Marquer. He's a French filmmaker. Um, he kind of is mm-hmm. the guy who really inspired the nerd writer to do YouTube essays because he, he's like the guy who really started the essay film. But he's made some really interesting movies like Sans Soleil and, um, and so, well, mainly Sans Soleil, but also The Cat Without a Grin. Um, a lot of great stuff and he kind of is more about taking images and putting them with these other images and what meaning can we derive from that. Um, and, but it's, it's kind of funny that I'm not even looking towards YouTube to pull an example and looking towards a filmmaker. So maybe that's kind of a problem with a lot of YouTubers is that they're more structure and craft focused and not so much on what does that represent? Right. Um, which I think is interesting because sometimes a movie has a certain pacing, not because it's a flaw, but be, but because that was the intention of the filmmaker. So, um, like for example, mm-hmm. for example, um, Full Metal Jacket, Jacket by Stanley Kubrick. Um, the second half of yeah. the film, 
which takes place in Vietnam, doesn't really have any story structure, um, which you could criticize and say, oh, that's bad. But Kubrick was kind of trying to illustrate the chaos of Vietnam by having almost no structure for the second half of the film. So you could say, oh, it's a flaw, it's a total mess. Or you could say, like, well, regardless if it works or not, he was trying to do this to express this. So... So yeah, it's mm-hmm. it's an interesting way. It's a very it's a it's a, I think your way of seeing it is superior. Well, maybe not superior, and that one one side like I I, right. I, I, I prefer your um, the way you dissect, dissect films over the way other people do or other YouTubers do. I mean, I'm not talking about movies in my videos, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, or, like... or that kind of, that kind of <laughs> essay, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It just I feel like we need more to balance it out. Yes. Know? And I mean, it, that kind of gets into where people complain about the politics of stuff and they want objective, ugh, objective fucking Christ, what, you know, what uh, is that word reviews even? of things. Yeah. It's, um, <sighs> people are, are, are weird. Arts, arts, not objective. It's just not, <laughs> you can't make, I a... mean, like, like there are like, like there are things that happen like you know the images are objectively happening like (laughs) i saw you know like the like a wikipedia plot summary is an objective review of a movie or a game you know what i mean that's (laughs) that's as objective as you get you know anything anything that has a value judgment immediately makes it subjective in fact when a when a so if you say the pacing is good yeah yeah, oh, I mean, no. you can go on. Oh, oh yeah, I was just gonna say like when a filmmaker or game designer makes a style that seems objective, that in itself is subjective. You know, being by being objective mm-hmm. in quotation marks, that's being subjective. So there's no such thing. It's a value judgment in itself, in a way. So um, right. if that's even possible to achieve that sort of objectivity. Um, anyway, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I cut in. I mean, no, no, it's fine. I'm, you know, yeah, it's just, and I don't know why people need it to be objective. Like, why do we need something to be right? I don't know. <sighs> I guess they just Sigh. want to validate their opinions, possibly. I don't know. I'm, I'm not really sure. It's a, this is a tough one. Um, yeah, I don't know. Is it okay if I just say I don't know? <laughs> I agree that is with you. Totally fine. I don't know either. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I yeah. guess that's for like that's. I got to do some interviews. I got to start making a expose on objectivity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should do like an interview cities like or, or an interview city. Sorry, it's the Mexican heat. Um, you should do an interview series. <laughs> just about objectivity and about how um, art and es- video essays or whatever cannot be objective unless you're just making a summary. So um, you should right. do it. Go for it. Like, I just want... <laughs> I want to, like, interview people who, like, position, you know, their position is things can be objective. Like, just to see, like, clearly what their thought process is. Because, like, I don't understand it. I really don't. I don't understand it either. You like just they need... just have this. You it's just. just... Go... Oh, sorry. <laughs> go, go on. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, frick, your laughing destroyed my thought. Uh, I'm so bad. <laughs> obliterated. I'm... No. Uh, yeah. Never again. This is never <laughs> happening again. <laughs> You just no, need uh, you just need to think of a catchy <laughs> a catchy phrase for the objectivity playlist podcast. Like what would be a clever name like um like not, nothing is absolute everything is permitted or something like really weird. I don't know. Oh yeah. <laughs> nothing is true. Yeah. <laughs> Assassin's Creed. Oh. Yeah, it keeps it in the realm of games, you know. Which is which is also an allusion to Dostoevsky. So, <laughs> fun fact. Oh, is oh, god damn it! <laughs> oh, I know it from the Assassin's Creed, and it's from freaking Dostoevsky. I feel like such a piece of shit. <laughs> uh, 
Oh my gosh, this is funny. This That's... is funny. <laughs> yeah. It's like when you learned that Thomas Jefferson didn't write uh, Life, Liberty, and Pursuit of Happiness. It was John Locke. You know, uh, and then you get really woke. Those stupid social philosophers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why, why do they have to come, come up with everything? Yeah. Um, oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> Well, well, you were able to do a great podcast with a uh, slightly giddy and kind of tired from the Mexican heat or in luck, hence all the laughter. So, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> maybe for I'm your glad night. you uh, had a <laughs> sorry, oh, please go on. I'm just no, I was, right. maybe the next podcast you'll have it with the real or in luck, like the one who isn't laughy. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah yeah i mean i don't know where you can find a cool place i mean how how is the the quote-unquote winter there it rains a lot <laughs> oh it's just so, a rainy season okay yeah it's uh it's just a rain gotcha. and, and a dry season so yeah um i will say that we just got um, out of the hottest time of the year which was april or May, I'm sorry, May. So it's going to get cooler, huh. which is nice. Um, yeah, the, yeah. Cl the climate here is kind of interesting like that. Like uh, we're entering the rainy season. So it's kind of reverse in a way. The winter is the summer with all the rain. And the hottest, oh, dry driest yeah. time of the year is um, basically October through April. So fun fact. That's really strange. You're definitely not below the equator. Um, no. I don't know why that's happening. Um, <laughs> that's Ecuador. That is where <laughs> the equator would be. There is a, you know what, I'm not, I'm not good at science, but there is an explanation. Yeah, you're, you're just going to have to look it up. <laughs> that's that's <fine. laughs> Okay, fine. So, 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 Oren, what's your opinion um, of this? Uh, just look it up. Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah uh so bef before we part um do you possibly have any video ideas or are you making anything or possibly able to make anything obviously you're teaching so that probably eats up a lot of your time but uh are you gonna get back to it yeah I, i'm gonna get back to it it's just um Right now it's a little bit hard and it's, it, I am taking a hiatus, um, but I suspect that yeah. I will try to make a video by the end of the year or 2018. So unfortunately mm -hmm. the hiatus is happening, but the good news is, is that I have 13 videos, um, most of which I'm proud of. Uh, <laughs> so please take a look at those videos. I right. put, put a lot of time and effort into those. Hopefully it will give you another perspective. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, I, I do want to get back into it. I really, really do. This will not be the last of, it's not just a video game. So, mm -hmm. and I think there's a baby crying. Well, I'm definitely back, looking forward road, to it. So, <laughs> yes, there is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just to explain that for people, um, listening to this podcast, there is a family who lives next door to where I am. And they actually make my meals, which is kind of nice. The only problem is, is oh. that their kids cry a lot. So, um. <laughs> uh, well, you win some, you lose some, I guess. Right. Yeah. Um, but thanks for having me, really. Oh yeah, no problem. Sorry, it took so long with you know school and stuff. No, yeah, this was actually really fun. If you want to invite me on again to discuss a particular subject please do um i'd be more than happy to yeah definitely uh maybe watch a movie or i don't know if you have time to play games necessarily but um Sigh. yeah I, I should i should buy a ps4 forget it i'm just gonna buy a ps4 um yeah or it's I'll cheaper do... than a switch that's so. that's true and the ps4 had like five or six amazing exclusives come out this year while the switch had one so uh oh wait that's not true and one two switch gosh i forgot about that game gotta play that right you cannot 
<laughs> but how did you play Bloodborne if you don't own a? Oh well, how did I... you play Bloodborne if you don't own a uh, PS4? I, I I left my PS4 back in the U.S. I should I should go back and get it. I should, oh okay. I should I, I felt like it would yeah, be just take too... a little drive. Take take a little drive. Take a little flight. Um, I just the reason why I didn't bring it is because yeah. I felt like it would be too much of a distraction because I have to experience Mexico. I need to focus on my work and uh i don't know maybe i'll get married down here mm-hmm. we'll see that, that, that's possible too um, oh wow <laughs> <laughs> um we shall see we shall see um it is too early to tell so <laughs> but yeah we could uh i mean uh i'm hoping on making a video on a uh a ghibli film uh, Tale of Princess Kaguya at some point during the summer. So, I mean, I'm branching out the channel to g- movies, you know, so it would make sense to have a movie podcast on here as well. Well, um, to be, well, I just want to say that that movie is amazing. So, um, that's, I would love to talk yes. about that. It's a very, oh my gosh, just the visuals in that movie is incredible. I know. I had to own an on Blu ray. Yes, you. Yes, <laughs> yes, you. You needed to own that on the <laughs> um, Well, yeah, I guess that's about it, right? So I, 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 I yeah. we definitely branched out a lot, which was great. I love going on tangents. Yes. So. <laughs> yeah. It. Yeah, it kept it kept it good pace. You know, good topics. Uh, thank you for being such a good interviewee. Such a good and, sport. Uh, yeah, hopefully we talk soon. All right, dude. This this was great. Um, thanks. Have me again. Woo. And, <laughs> and cut.